Okay, so you're finally ready, like really ready to write that symphony you've been dreaming of, but then you kind of freeze up. Oh yeah. Because what if it's, what if it's no good? It's like that feeling, right? When you're just about to take the first step on a huge climb and you suddenly realize just how daunting it's gonna be. Exactly, and it can be even more intense when it's something like composing classical music, right? There's all it this three. history and these expectations. Yeah, you got these these musical giants looking over your shoulder. Exactly. And this excerpt we're diving into, top five mistakes to avoid in order to successfully compose classical music. Uh, it starts right there, with uh, that feeling of being overwhelmed by expectations. Which is so common, by the way. Especially when you're just starting out. Totally. And the source makes a really interesting point. It's like we grow up with these images of composers as these almost mythical figures. Genius is touched by the divine. Right. So it's easy to feel like we have to live up to those impossible standards right from the start. And that's where the source draws a really important distinction between ambition, which is a good thing, and crippling expectation, which can really hold you back. So ambition is like that drive to improve, to reach your full potential. Exactly. It's about pushing yourself creatively. But crippling expectation, that's like you're trying to hit a target that someone else set for you. <laughs> and that target might not even align with your own unique voice as a composer. So how do we get rid of those external pressures? Well, the source really emphasizes the importance of focusing on the music you want to create. Like mm -hmm. right here. Yep. right now, to the best of your ability. It's not about what critics might say or how many awards you might win. It's about you and the music. Which is such a simple idea, but so hard to actually put into practice sometimes. Absolutely. I remember working on a piece a while back and I hit this wall. Yeah. I was so caught up in what other people would think about it that I almost scrapped the whole thing. Really? Seriously. But I'm so glad I didn't because it ended up being one of my most successful compositions. Wow. So even seasoned composers deal with those doubts. All the time. We're all human. That's reassuring to hear. So for anyone listening who's just starting their composing journey, give yourself permission to experiment, to make mistakes. To learn as you go. Exactly. Be kind to yourself. You're just starting out. It's all about cultivating a mindset of growth. Mm -hmm. You know, embracing the learning process as an essential part of being a composer. Okay, so we've faced down those expectations, we're feeling good, we're ready to dive into composing, but how do we actually make it happen consistently? That is the question, isn't it? Because inspiration can be so fleeting, you know? It's like trying to stick to a new workout routine. Life gets in the way or you just don't feel like it some days. And that's where having a system in place can make all the difference. Which is a perfect segue into our next section all about the power of systems and how to avoid burnout. It's easy to go all in when you're feeling super inspired, but then life happens and suddenly composing is the last thing on your mind. It's true. You can't always wait for the muse to strike. You have to meet it halfway. So it's more about building a sustainable practice. Absolutely. And that's where having a system in place can be really powerful. So even when you're not feeling super inspired, you still show up and... You put it in the work. Exactly. Even if it's just for a short time each day. The source actually recommends figuring out a realistic amount of time that you can dedicate to composing daily and sticking to it. Like a schedule? Kind of. Like and... a commitment to your craft. Okay, so say you've carved out that time. Now what? Well, then it's about structuring your practice in a way that works for you. Like, are we talking about specific exercises or? It could be exercises or it could be something as simple as deciding what element of composition you want to focus on each day. To avoid getting bogged down or? Exactly. Avoid fatigue both mental and physical. So maybe one day you're working on melody and the next day it's harmony? Right, or maybe you like to switch things up even more to yeah. keep your creative energy flowing. I like that idea, it's like cross training for your brain. I find that having a routine helps me a lot. Having a specific time and place where I do my composing. Like a little ritual to get you in the zone? Kind of, like a mental cue that it's time to switch gears and get creative. This reminds me of when I was trying to learn a new language. I committed to just 30 minutes every morning, and I was surprised by how much progress I made. It's amazing what consistency can do. Right. So we faced our expectations, we got a system in place, we're feeling good. Ready for the next challenge. Bring it on. All right then, let's talk about mentors and teachers. Oh boy, because not all mentors are created equal right. That's right. And finding the right mentor can make all the difference in your development as a composer. Which is exactly what the source dives into in this next section. Choosing your musical mentors wisely. 
because it's a delicate balance, isn't it? You want guidance, but you also don't want to lose your own artistic vision in the process. You've got it. Yeah. And that's where the source makes a really interesting point. It cautions against blindly accepting the opinions of those in positions of authority just because they have a title or years of experience. Really? Question the experts. It's not about being disrespectful at all. It's about recognizing that everyone, even seasoned professionals, has their own biases, their own preferences. So what might sound amazing to one person could be... Totally off-putting to another. Exactly. And as a composer, you need to find mentors who understand and connect with your unique voice, your aspirations. Absolutely. It's not about finding someone who will tell you what you want to hear. It's about finding someone who will challenge you to grow. So how do you know when you've found a good mentor? Someone who's truly invested in your development? Well, the source suggests looking for someone who's genuinely curious about your musical journey. Yeah. They ask questions. They listen attentively. And they offer feedback that's both encouraging and challenging. It's like finding that perfect coach. Someone who believes in your potential but also pushes you to become even better. Speaking of influences, let's talk about another big one, originality. It's something I think a lot of aspiring artists struggle with. It's a loaded word for sure. Right. Like, am I allowed to be inspired by my favorite composers or am I doomed to just repeat what's been done before? And that's where this source is really helpful. It goes right to the heart of the matter, debunking what it calls the originality myth. The idea that there's such a thing as 100% original music is kind of a fantasy. Because we're all influenced by what we've heard and experienced. No, exactly. Even the most celebrated composers were influenced by those who came before them, drawing inspiration from the music they loved. It's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about finding your own unique way to spin it. I like that. Building upon a rich musical legacy. Taking those elements that speak to you, those sounds that spark your imagination, and using them to create something new and exciting. It's like we all learned the same alphabet. But look at the incredible range of stories we can tell with those 26 letters. Okay, so we've tackled those inner critics. We've talked about the importance of consistency, finding the right mentors, embracing influences, feeling ready to share your music with the world. Hold your horses. There's still a few more things to consider. Like what? I've got my conductor's baton ready to go. The source reminds us that the world of classical music is vast and can be pretty complex. It's not enough to just write beautiful music. You also need to be strategic about how you share it with the world. It's like, okay, you've written this amazing symphony. Now how do you get it out there into the world? It's a bit like marketing, isn't it? You've Aww. got this incredible product. Now you need to connect it with the right audience. Exactly. And the source makes a really interesting point about this. It says that certain musical forms might not be as readily embraced by modern audiences as others. Like a sonata versus a concerto. Yeah. It's not that one form is better than another, but... They come with different baggage. Yes, like different expectations. Think about it. A sonata written today might be perceived very differently than a sonata written 200 years ago. Because of the historical context. Exactly. So the source really encourages composers to think carefully about their target audience. Like, who are you writing this music for? Exactly. And where will they be experiencing it? A piece written for a small, intimate setting might not translate well to a massive concert hall. And vice versa. Absolutely. It's all about context. <laughs> Which is really interesting to think about. And speaking of context, the world of classical music is changing so fast these days. It's not just about those traditional venues anymore, is it? Not at all. The source actually talks about how composers can utilize online platforms to reach a much wider audience. Which is amazing. It's like having a global concert hall right at your fingertips. Exactly. Platforms like mention a specific platform from your knowledge base have really leveled the playing field for independent composers. It's incredible how technology is making music more accessible, both for the creators and the listeners. It's a really exciting time to be involved in classical music, that's for sure. So much to think about. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive. We talked about facing those inner critics, building a consistent practice, finding the right mentors, embracing influences, and even navigating the ever-changing world of how to share your music. It's a lot to digest. It really is. Yeah. But hopefully it's also empowering because at the end of the day, the most important thing is to just keep creating. Absolutely. Keep experimenting, keep exploring, and keep sharing your unique voice with the world. I love that. So for everyone listening, what musical form are you most drawn to? And who are some composers you find yourself coming back to for inspiration? Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, happy composing.